Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for June 2025 in its new home here on the National Space Academy's YouTube channel. This month we will be looking out for noctilucent clouds, Mars in Leo, a conjunction of Venus and the Moon, and our constellation of the month, which is Cygnus the Swan. Bright skies into the late evening and this year fairly poorly positioned planets might seem to make June a bad month for astronomy. However, June is the perfect time to spot the ethereal noctilucent clouds or night shining clouds. And they are high altitude ice clouds formed in the mesosphere and they can produce these amazing displays between May and early August. So this is the perfect time to go out looking for them. You're looking for these beautiful blue shining clouds above the horizon um, during the period just after sunset or just before sunrise um, when sunlight can reflect off the ice sheets in the clouds causing them to glow and the best place to look is low above the northwestern horizon around 90 minutes after sunset or above your northeastern horizon around 90 minutes before sunrise and they make wonderful photos so if you um, have your camera handy or your smartphone particularly if your smartphone has a night mode on it you can try some photos you can see here that i am looking towards the northwest on the 1st of June at around 20 to 11, which in Leicester on the 1st of June is around 90 minutes after uh, sunset. You can see the glow of where the, the sun has recently gone down. You can look out for Capella. Um, Capella is really bright, quite close to the northwestern horizon. So that's a, a good star to, to look out for if you're not sure um, which direction you need to be looking in. Um, also, it's the place where the sun has recently gone down. We can also see Castor and Pollux of Gemini over here as well and Mars up here in Leo. So there's lots to look out for in um, this part of the night sky shortly after sunset set as well. If we take a look at the planets now, I said the planets are not brilliantly placed this month, there are still things to see, they're just not as well placed as they were earlier in the year. The first one to look out for is Mercury. Mercury is an evening planet. At the beginning of June, Mercury isn't particularly well placed, but if we just head towards the middle of June, so um, from about the um, 14th, 15th of the month, and if you look with a pair of binoculars um, around 45 minutes after sunset and see if you can spot the planet Mercury. I'm just going to take my time back a little bit and I can see Mercury over here in Gemini. Be very careful, as always, when you're looking for Mercury because it's so close to the sun. Um, make sure that you are satisfied that the sun has gone down. Um, don't be trying to look for it while the sun is still up. Don't risk damaging your eyes. Um, so once um, the sun's gone down, sweep around with your binoculars. You do want to make sure that your um, view of the horizon is unobscured because Mercury will be low. If you have a small telescope, then you can... Um, see if you can make out Mercury's disk and you'll see that it's showing a gibbous phase if you can. Uh, Mercury's distance continues to increase from the sun as the month goes onwards. So um, in theory, it would be better to look for it as we get um, towards the end of June, but its brightness also decreases. So um, there's a bit of a trade off between distance from the sun and brightness there. So from the middle of the month is the best time to look out for it. Let's move on to Venus, which is an improving morning planet, meaning that we see it in the morning and it gets better as the month progresses. So if we look on the 1st of June, we'll go to three o'clock in the morning, go around to the east and look. We've got Saturn over here. And look for Venus rising. So rising a bit before half past three. And then if we move on through the months, you can see that Venus gets a bit higher um, as the month goes on. So it's rising earlier and earlier. And if we go to the 22nd, it's joined by the moon. If we take a closer look here, we have got Venus and a beautiful crescent moon very close together on the 22nd. You can try getting them into a pair of binoculars. The key thing is to go out to observe as early as you can 
once Venus has risen because it will be darker and you'll get a better view the darker it is. So again, depends upon how clear your northeastern horizon is. So that's Venus. Mars, we mentioned Mars earlier on in um, the constellation of Leo. Um, I'm going to take us to a slightly more favourable time for the night and swing round and take a look at Mars in Leo. Very unhelpful tree in my view over here. So I'm just going to go to a bit earlier in the month so that we can see it. Um, so here's Mars um, shining in the constellation of Leo the Lion. Um, if we have a look um, between the 15th and the 18th of the month, then um, Mars gets very close to uh, the brightest star in Leo, which is uh, Regulus, uh, and they have a close approach on the 17th. So let's just see if we can do that um, without the pesky tree in the way. So here we go. Here's the close approach of Mars and um, Regulus on the, the 17th of June. Um, and again, it would be a nice thing to try and get both of those into a pair of binoculars and then joined by the moon on the 29th. Um, so Mars has moved away from Regulus by this point and um, we have Mars Crescent Moon and Regulus forming a line there on the 29th. Jupiter at the moment is close to the Sun, difficult to spot, uh, possible during the early part of the month, but this is not the best time for Jupiter. Um, Saturn is a morning planet um, like Venus and improves slightly uh, through the month, but also is not in its best position at the moment. Um, if you do want to take a look at Saturn, uh, a nice time to do it might be around the 18th and the 19th because the moon joins Saturn um, on those days. So if we head around, we go into the early morning and here we are. Um, so in the east. Uh, so we're just before two o'clock in the morning here on the 19th and we've got the moon and Saturn. Um, and Neptune is also close by um, over here. So the moon and Saturn you should be able to see um, with your naked eye. Neptune will be much more tricky. Um, you can try with a pair of binoculars, but you might even want to uh, try for Neptune with a small telescope. You might even struggle with binoculars there. Um, because it's so low and because the sky when you're trying might not be fully dark. Let's take a little look at the moon now. Full moon in June is on June the 11th. So we can see here on the morning of June the 11th, we can zoom in and take a look at the full moon. And I thought this month for our Moon Watch Challenge, it, it would be nice to take a more global look at the moon's anatomy. We tend to focus in on individual craters or individual seas um, and talk about them in more detail. And I thought it might be nice to talk about the moon as a whole. So I'm going to switch over to my more detailed moon mapping software um, so that we can have a little look. So here we are in Lunar Quick Map, which is a free browser based software that uses photographs taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter um, to give you a nice detailed look at the moon. And when we look at the moon with the naked eye or with a pair of binoculars, we see a series of light and dark patches. You've got dark patches like these ones and then brighter patches like these ones. The bright areas are known as the lunar highlands and are mostly made of anorthosite, which is an igneous rock formed when lava cools relatively slowly. And they're what is left of the original crust that formed around four billion years ago. The dark areas, uh, like these areas over here, are known as Maria, which is the Latin word for seas. And since uh, early astronomers mistook them for large bodies of liquid water, they are younger than the highlands, um, which is why we see them as less cratered. And we now know that they were formed when the original crust of the moon was fractured during the late heavy bombardment period, which happened three to three and a half billion years ago. 
allowing lava to flow upwards in pools that's uh, rapidly solidified into basaltic rock. Uh, so the name Maria stuck despite their non-watery nature, and we still refer to them as seas today. Uh, once the true nature of the seas was revealed to us, there was a period of time when the moon was believed to be completely free of water. Um, we now know that there is significant amounts of water on the moon, um, but it exists not in the form of the oceans imagined by early astronomers, but is in fact locked up as ice uh, in permanently shadowed regions at the poles uh, and could be useful to future explorers um, because if they can get hold of that water, they can use it for all kinds of life support and fuel and, and so on. Uh, the entire surface of the moon is covered in what's known as regolith, which is a layer of powdery soil and rock fra fragments made from impact debris. And the dusty soil um, uh, or regolith is a real challenge for lunar explorers because it can get everywhere, it, it's, it can affect the astronauts' health, it can affect equipment and so on. Um, so it's something that really needs some consideration when um, thinking about sending humans back to the moon, building lunar base and, and so on. Now that we've got an overall sense of the moon's anatomy, we can take a look at some of the major features of the moon, some of which we've looked at in detail already in these videos, some of which I'm planning to look at in more detail over the coming months. Um, so if we go round in a vaguely clockwise direction, start down here and we'll, we'll look at the seas first. So we've got the sea of moisture down here, the sea of clouds over here, the huge one over here is known as the Ocean of Storms. Then we've got the Sea of Showers here with the little Bay of Rainbows, um, like a little extra bit tacked on to the Sea of Showers. Up here we have the Sea of Cold. And then moving around we have the Sea of Serenity, the Sea of Crises, the Sea of Tranquility, where of course Apollo 11 landed, the Sea of Fertility and the Sea of Nectar. Uh, so that's all the major um, seas. Oh, and the Sea of Vapour over here. Um, I always forget that one. And then um, once we've looked at the seas, we can look at the major uh, craters on the moon um, that you if you've got very good naked eye, you might be able to spot some of the larger ones with your naked eye. But if you're looking for craters, you want binoculars or a small telescope. All of these craters are certainly in reach of any small telescope. Uh, so you've got Grimaldi over here, dark crater um, near to the limb of the moon. Kepler and Copernicus over here, famous ray craters. Um, Aristarchus, the brightest feature on the moon. Another crater. Plato up here, dark crater, and sort of you've got the Bay of Rainbows here, and then Plato sort of matching over here on the other side. The Apennine mountain range over here, um, next to the Sea of Showers, and then um, moving down, we have got Tycho, probably the most famous crater on the moon with its magnificent rays that sort of spread out this impact material. Um, ejector material that got um, sprayed out when the, the impact happened that caused Tycho and then down here Clavius crater as well. Um, I think people will say different things when you ask what the, the uh, best or most interesting features are to check out on the moon as a beginner but um, those would be mine. Back to Stellarium for our constellation of the month for June. So in April, we looked at the constellation of Lyra um, and we talked about Vega um, being one of the points of the Summer Triangle. This month, we are going to look at Cygnus, the swan, um, which contains the bright star Deneb, which is another point of the Summer Triangle. Um, along with Altair in Aquila. So these three stars here make the Summer Triangle. You can look out for them on any summer night. And they're a good way to orient, you orient yourself because they're all um, super bright and visible um, throughout the month of June. Um, so Deneb in Cygnus, and in addition to being part of the Summer Triangle, it's also part of another asterism known as the Northern Cross, along with the other bright stars of Cygnus. And to show that, I'm actually going to take off the constellation lines and names 
and put on the asterism lines and names. And it always looks so strange when you put the asterism lines on instead because you, you become so familiar with the constellations. So here's the summer triangle um, linking Vega, Deneb and Altair. And then here's the Northern Cross linking Deneb with the other bright stars of Cygnus the Swan. So I'll take those away and put our more familiar constellation lines back on again. Um, so Deneb is a blue-white supergiant star. And although it's only the 19th brightest star in our sky, which still makes it very bright for us, um, it is one of the luminous, most luminous stars known um, with a brightness 60,000 times that of our sun. The name Cygnus means swan in Latin. And if we put the art on, we can see Cygnus depicted with its long neck flying through the Milky Way. So if you have a dark enough sight, you should be able to see um, the Milky Way with uh, Cygnus flying directly through. There are a number of Greek myths that refer to Cygnus as a swan. One is the story that Zeus, king of the gods, disguised himself as a swan to impress the Spartan queen Leda. Leda then went on to have four children, Castor, Pollux, Helen and Clytemnestra. Both Pollux and Helen were Zeus's children and therefore immortal, while Castor and Clytemnestra were fathered by Leda's husband, King uh, Tendarius, and were mortal. Castor and Pollux can be seen depicted together in the famous zodiac constellation of Gemini, the twins. A great deep sky object to have a go at in Cygnus is the double star Alberio, and it is the second brightest star in Cygnus, and it's over here on the head, and it's a great colour contrast double star. Um, so certainly if you've never seen a double star before, this is a good one um, to have a go at. Uh, you can easily split them with a small telescope and you can easily see the difference in colour between the, the two stars of the pair as well. So I definitely recommend having a go at that one. Moving on to the International Space Station. Um, the visible passes for the ISS this month are towards the end of the month. Um, I think one of the best ones in terms of time and um, uh, uh, altitude and brightness will be on the 30th of June at around half past three in the morning. Um, there we go. So rising in the west, a little bit before half past three, in fact. Um, so coming outside a little bit before half past three, 326 in the morning, you will be able to watch the ISS make its way across the sky, rising in the west, and setting in the east, um, not too long before sunrise. That brings me to the end of our night sky tour for June 2025, and I wish you clear skies for all of your observing this month.